the story of a boy and his lion, or something like that. Good evening, everyone. This is Stone Gas Man, live from New York City. And tonight we are going to be doing a 50th anniversary audio commentary for a, uh, uh, a very forgotten Disney flick called Napoleon and Samantha. It came out of approximately 50 years ago today on July 5th, uh, 1972. And this was a Disney film I was uh, completely unaware of my entire life. I mean, and I'm usually well versed, I think, in Disney, um, uh, Disney films, especially from that era. But this is one that had just seemed to always escape me. And when I was going through the 1972 releases and I came upon this one, I thought to myself, well, this looks interesting. It's starring Michael Douglas, and it also features Jodie Foster in her film debut, and she's 10 years old. Jodie Foster makes her film debut at 10 in this movie. And dare I say it has a very, it, you know, uh, something happened uh, during the production of which made it really traumatizing for her. And uh, we will definitely cover that. I've only heard this movie for one reason. I'm sure you'll get at some point. Yes. Uh, here again, this movie needs to be seen to be believed. Uh, it's not available on Disney Plus, so you're going to have to rent it from either uh, Amazon or YouTube, just to let you all know. But it is so worth it. Um it's only 92 minutes, and like I said, I mean, I only added this to my 50th anniversary commentary list for the simple reason it has Michael Douglas and Jodie Foster. That's a lot of star power right there. Even if it's a film from 1972, that's that's uh, quite a bit of star power. So I said, well, shit, I got to do this movie. So um, at any rate, I think we will go ahead and get started here. We are paused on the Buena Vista distribution logo. And we will start at three, two, one, and play. Walt Disney Productions. <laughs> uh, one of the most... <laughs> this, this Disney movie, like I said, it needs to be seen to be believed. Now, I really do like these opening credits. Uh, obviously, setting it out in the country and everything as we go through the cast here. Uh, very, very colorful title sequence, I must admit. Uh, Co-starring Jodie Foster as Samantha. Henry Jones as Mr. Gunridge. And Major the Lion as played by Major. And uh, yes, v Vito Scotti is the clown. We will talk about him. Uh, Mary Wicks is the clerk. And Ellen Corby. I mean, a lot of you will recognize those names and uh, faces when I get to them. But um, at any rate, so this is truly one of the most bizarre movies that the studio has ever put out. And it's just amazing. Now, before we move any further, you'll notice up at the top there, associate producers Tom Leach and Stuart Raphael. Uh, those two names we're going to be talking about quite a bit uh, throughout this commentary. Uh, Tom Leach was... Uh, a producer of uh, Disney films and Stuart uh, Raphael uh, at this time was still a screenwriter and an animal handler. And uh, he would later become uh, the director of such infamous films as uh, Mac and me, Tammy and the T-Rex and the ice pirates. Uh, but this movie is not directed by Stuart Raffle. It is directed by Bernard uh, McEVT and uh, at first I thought, okay, I've never heard of his name before. I mean, this probably is the only film he's ever directed. Now, he directed a couple of Disney films back in this period. Uh, on screen, we see a 10-year-old Jodie Foster uh, just uh, emerging from the bushes here and uh, uh, playing around with her friend, uh, Napoleon, played by Johnny Whitaker. And, uh, uh, played by Johnny Whitaker, yes, excuse me. Yeah, sorry about that. I had to get rid of uh, the YouTube windows because uh, I was talking uh, on there and you could hear me, but I got rid of that. So um, at any rate, so uh, yes. Now, Johnny Whitaker, I, I suppose we should go ahead and start with him. He... Uh, 
He was uh, on a sitcom which aired from 1966 to 1971 called Family Affair. And uh, Whitaker played the role of an orphan boy named Jody Davis, uh, living in a high-rise apartment in New York City with his twin sister, Buffy, played by Anissa Jones, and her older sister, Sissy, played by Kathy Garber. His bachelor uncle, Bill Davis, played by Brian Keith, who was in The Parent Trap, and Bill's gentleman's gentleman, Mr. French, played by Sebastian Cabot. Jody and Buffy were originally supposed to be different ages, but the show's producers thought Whitaker and Jones looked so cute together that they changed them to be twins. While a regular on the show, Whitaker also starred in the Hallmark Hall of Fame production The Littlest Angel alongside Fred Gwynn and Tony Randall and an episode of the long-running episode The Virginian in 1969. And uh, we just saw Henry Jones uh, come out uh, from up there. But just to finish with Johnny Whitaker real quick, uh, after a family appeared, uh, after family affair, he appeared in a two-part episode of Gunsmoke uh, in 1971, and he went on to star in the 1973 Sid and Marty Croft Saturday Morning Children series Sigmund and the Sea Monsters, alongside Billy Barty and Scott Colden, and appeared in numerous other feature films, including Snowball Express, uh, which was released by uh, Buena Vista in December of 1972, uh, The Biscuit Eater. And, and The Magic Pony. And his most prominent feature film role during this period was the lead in the musical version of Tom Sawyer, uh, which was produced by Arthur P. Jacobs behind the Planet of the Apes franchise, and it starred Jodie Foster as Becky Thatcher. So uh, they would these kids would star again in the, the Tom Sawyer, Sawyer roles uh, one year after Napoleon and Samantha. In 1999, Whitaker received the Young Artist Former Child Light Star Lifetime Achievement Award at the 20th Youth and Film Awards. And in 2012, Whitaker co-produced and co-hosted a short-lived radio talk show called Dr. Zod and Johnny Show. In 2016, Whitaker gave a guest star cameo appearances in Amazon's reboot of Sigmund and the Sea Monsters. In the premiere episode, he played the part of heckling boat owner Zach against David Arquette's salty character, Captain Barnabas. The episode had a similar cameo appearance by original show creators Sid and Marty Croft. So he didn't do a lot of films. I mean, he did do this one, Napoleon and Samantha, and of course, uh, Snowball Express and Tom Sawyer. Uh, but that's about it. Uh, that, that's about the extent as far as his uh, uh, film career is concerned. And like I said, the last thing he did were, you know, five episodes of that 2016 redo of Sigmund and the Sea Monsters. So that, you know, that gave him some fame. And I got to admit that I do like the kids in this movie. I mean, if I didn't like the kids in this movie, I wouldn't even do this commentary, uh, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but, you know, it's very fascinating to see uh, 10-year-old Jodie Foster and uh, this uh, other and this other pretty talented kid named Johnny Whitaker. And uh, they're acting together in this in this Disney movie where uh, basically, they, uh, they they just gave Henry Jones some bottles so they can feed uh, this horse. Pretty nice. Yeah. But as far as Jodie Foster is concerned, this was her first movie. Uh, she had never appeared on screen before. She was, uh, she, I think she was just shy of 10. She was either 10 or she was just about to uh, uh, be, uh, uh, get 10 years old. Uh, but yeah, she was super young in this movie. I mean, this was before, you know, Martin Scorsese cast her in Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore and her and her career defining performance in uh, Taxi Driver, uh, where she plays the uh, 12 year old prostitute that uh, Robert De Niro, uh, the um, <laughs> uh, messed up Vietnam veteran Robert De Niro vows he has to protect against the, uh, the scum of the, uh, the inner city. Uh, one of Scorsese's best films, and uh, Jodie Foster is primarily known for the, uh, for those, as well as many of her later roles. And what's amazing is that even though I have not se I have not seen every Jodie Foster movie, I'm going to be perfectly honest. However, the truth of the matter is, even though I loved uh, Silence of the Lambs, and uh, you know she was amazing and she deserved the Oscar for that. Truth of the matter is, my personal uh, favorite Jodie Foster performance is in um, Robert Zemeckis' Contact, which came out in 1997 based on the novel by Carl Sagan. And uh, I am actually uh, going to start that novel very soon 
uh, because I'm going to be doing a 25th anniversary commentary for uh, Contact probably next weekend. I mean, it may be this weekend, depending upon if I get the book done. But I am going to definitely do Contact very, very soon. And I, uh, <clears throat> uh, like I said, I'm a huge fan of that movie and Foster's performance in it. Now, this actress right here uh, uh, in the role of Gertrude, who is basically Samantha's ca caretaker, uh, this is an actress by the name of Ellen Corby. And uh, she was an American actress and a screenwriter uh, best known for playing uh, Grandma Walton, uh, Esther, on the, uh, the Waltons, where she won three Emmy Awards. And uh, she was also nominated for an Academy Award and a Golden Globe Award won a Golden Globe Award, actually, for her performances, Aunt Trina in uh, the 1948 movie I Remember Mama. And actually, it's very funny that um, she did that movie because that's the other big movie that Barbara Bel Geddes did. And Barbara Bel Geddes is best known for doing Vertigo, which Ellen Corby also appears in Vertigo. If you remember, she played the, uh, the runner of the McKittrick Hotel uh, that... Uh, 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 Kim's character disappears in when uh, Jamie Stewart, uh, Jimmy Stewart is pursuing her through the streets of San Francisco. And she stops at this hotel and presumably has a room and goes up there to just to sit two or three times a week, according to uh, Ellen Corby. But yeah, that's uh, uh, for the Waltons and for that part in Vertigo, she's most famous for. And uh, the role of the uh, grandfather right here to, uh, uh, Johnny Whitaker's character is uh, an actor by the name of Will Gear, and he was uh, an American actor, musician, and social activist who was active in labor organizing and other movements in New York and Southern California in the 30s and 40s. Uh, in, in California, he befriended rising singer Woody Guthrie, whose story would, of course, be later told uh, in the 1976 biopic um, uh, Bound for Glory, directed by Hal Ashby and starring uh, David Carradine, which is uh, one of the masterpieces, one of the unsung masterpieces of the 1970s. And uh, Will Gear and uh, Woody Guthrie both lived in New York for a time in the 40s, but he ended up being on the blacklist. He ended up being blacklisted in the 1950s uh, by Hollywood after refusing in testimony before Congress to name persons who had joined the Communist Party. So he had been blacklisted for a number of years uh, before he came back for this role in uh, Napoleon and Samantha. And uh, among his other films, he had started out in the 1930s with movies like Misleading Lady and Spitfire. And uh, he would later go on to do uh, movies like Winchester 73 with James Stewart and Broken Arrow. That was another uh, popular J Jimmy Stewart movie at the time. Uh, he was in The Searchers. He was in Salt of the Earth. Uh, Advise and Consent, uh, 1962. The Trials of O'Brien, uh, Seconds, uh, the magnificent film uh, Seconds, directed by John Frankenheimer. Uh, he was also the prosecutor in In Cold Blood. Uh, he played Candy in, a, in the 1968 version of, of Mice and Men. And around this time, he was doing, you know, uh, Gunsmoke and Bonanza and, you know, shows like that. Hawaii Five O, you know, I mean, that kind of television work just to uh, keep on working and everything. And uh, after Napoleon and Samantha, he really didn't do much. I mean, he was, uh, well, actually, he was in the Waltons as well as Zebulon Tyler Walton. So, yeah, he was uh, just as big as, um, uh, just as big as Ellen Corby, uh, uh, Ellen Corby was on that show. Hmm. And uh, the role of Dimitri the Clown here, this is, uh, uh, this is Vito Scotti. And uh, Vito, Vito Scotti, he, was, he did a lot of dramatic and comedy roles on Broadway and uh, in films from the late 30s to the mid-1990s. And uh, bo both these actors are obviously uh, no longer with us. But um, Vito started out in 1949 in films like Crisscross Cross and Illegal Entry and uh, would later do uh, such... Um, I'm trying to recognize anything in this uh, list. I mean, Pocket Full of Miracles, 1961, uh, Frank Capra, he did do that one. He did Where the Boys Are, uh, 1960, where he played the maitre d' of a tropical isle, uncredited. A lot of those roles in the, in the early days were very uncredited. 
But by 1967, he, he was doing movies like Perils of Pauline and Head and uh, Cactus Flower, where he played Senor Arturo uh, Sanchez. And uh, But his most famous role was actually as uh, uh, Nazarene in The Godfather. Uh, that's where most people know him from. And, of course, The Godfather came out uh, only a few months before uh, Napoleon and Samantha. I did a commentary on it uh, just a few months ago. One of his last movies was actually he played Armando in uh, Herbie Goes Bananas. I'm trying to remember which character that was because I saw Herbie Goes Bananas like a dozen times when I was a kid. Uh, and his last movie, believe it or not, was Get Shorty, uh, the John Travolta, Danny DeVito crime caper uh, from 1995 where he played the manager of Vesuvio's. And I could be wrong, but I believe that was the restaurant where the big incident in the middle of the movie happened where... Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to remember. Like John Travolta, like dodged somebody on the stairs, and he sat next to uh, uh, somebody with a neck brace. I, oh man, I haven't seen Get Shorty in years. I haven't seen it in years, but I have a feel. I mean, I do remember that restaurant scene, so I do wonder if that's the same thing. So yeah, they decide to adopt uh, this uh, clown's lion uh, when the clown decides to go back to Europe, and. Uh, <laughs> obviously a very, very tame lion right here. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Do Would parents get nervous automatically when they see scenes like this? Because, uh, okay, from what I understand, that you know, this, this lion, um, we're going to have to talk about the lion because... Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but uh, evidently this uh, lion was known as um, Zamba, although uh, uh, the, the animal is actually billed as um, Major. Uh, and he's, and he's been in the movie called Major, although the, uh, uh, reportedly the name of the actual lion was Zamba. And... Um, See, uh, purchased from animal dealer Henry Treffick and trained by Ralph F. Helfer, in addition to being used as the MGM Lion, also appeared in other productions such as the religious epic King of Kings, The Lion, Zebra in the Kitchen, Fluffy, and Napoleon and Samantha, as well as a memorable TV commercial for Dreyfus Investments in 1961. Now, okay, Wikipedia says that this is the actual lion that was used as uh, Leo the lion, the eighth lion for MGM's logo, uh, and that he was born in 1956 in a Dublin zoo in Ireland. But uh, for some reason, um, I mean, yeah, this lion has basically three names. I mean, you know, Leah, Zamba, and um, in, in the film where, where he's uh, known as, uh, yeah, I just forgot the other name, whatever. <laughs> Major, excuse me, yes. So Will Gear looks like he's on the verge of dying here, and he sees uh, uh, the lion. <laughs> now, okay, we need to talk about. Oh, oh, good. Um, Vito was funny in several Adams Family episodes. Oh, wow! And I enjoyed Candle Shoe, one of Foster's earliest roles. Yeah, and um, but it's amazing, Cliff, because it was on the uh, Disney movie Freaky Friday, uh, where she actually did some bonus material for the DVD. And on that bonus material, she uh, tells a story of working on Napoleon and Samantha, where apparently she was not only attacked by a lion, uh, but almost mauled. Uh, I mean, uh, well, actually, the uh, Wikipedia page does say she was mauled, essentially. But OK, so the film Napoleon and Samantha was shot in John Day, Oregon. And uh, apparently during the production, Foster was mauled by a substitute lion. So it wasn't major. Okay, so it wasn't major, but it was a substitute lion used on the film set and still has, and she still has scars on her back and stomach. She said, quote, I was walking ahead of him. He was on an invisible leash, some piano wire. He got sick of me being slow, picked me up and held me sideways and shook me like a doll. I was in shock and thought it was an earthquake. 
I turned around and saw the entire crew running off in the other direction. The trainer then said, drop it. And he opened his mouth and he dropped me. The incident left her with lifelong uh, aleurophobia, which is a somewhat rare animal phobia characterized by the persistent and excessive fear of cats. Like other specific phobias, the exact cause of aleurophobia is unknown and potential treatment usually involves therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, uh, in this case, we can see exactly why the where the cause of aleurophobia Euro, was for uh, Jodie Foster. So I have a feeling that she cannot watch this film today for any reason because of that. And uh, look, I'm just glad that she survived the production. I mean, that's a pretty horrific experience to have on your very first film where you're, you know, nearly mauled to death by a lion. But one thing's for sure, I bet that uh, her and her, her and uh, Melanie Griffith could, could uh, should exchange uh, their stories because, um, uh, funnily enough, um, <laughs> Melanie Griffith's mother, who was in uh, The Birds, uh, she um, did a movie with her husband called Roar. And Roar is basically chaos on screen. I mean, basically... Uh, they had like a sanctuary with like a, over a hundred wild animals, including tigers and lions. And uh, I mean, a lot of the crew members were actually suffered injuries. I mean, the director of photography, Jan de Bont, you know, got like, you know, a bunch of stitches in his head, as well as Melanie Griffith, who we actually see on screen with her mother, Tippi Hedren, as she is being mauled by a lion. It's pretty horrific. It's it's pretty horrific stuff. Uh, so that's what I'm saying. I'm not, I mean, I don't want to, I'm not trying to joke, but at the same time, you know, I think that Jodie Foster and Melanie Griffith would have a lot to, uh, uh, have a lot to talk about if they ever got together in the same room. <laughs> but that is just a, an absolutely traumatizing thing to happen, especially, like I said, this is a Disney production. I wouldn't be surprised if that was, um, you know, kept under wraps and uh, they didn't want a lot of people outside the studio knowing about this little incident. I mean, I mean, look, I mean, Jodie Foster is still, uh, you know, she's still very much acting. I mean, she just did a, a movie this year. She did uh, just did a movie uh, this year, which is going to be. Uh, released very soon. I found this very interesting. It's called um, uh, Nyad, which is a uh, biographical sports drama directed by Elizabeth uh, Chow Vasarhali and Jimmy Chin and starring Annette Benning as, um, well, she, she's basically a diver. She, and she, uh, or she, she attempts to swim from like, Cuba to, oh, I forget, I forget. Uh, I mean, forgive me, I'm sorry, everybody. Wikipedia is usually uh, not very good when it comes to these kind of uh, uh, future productions in, in their uh, descriptions. But um, uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, Diana Nyad uh, gained national attention in 1975 when she swam, swam around Manhattan, and in 1979, when she swam from North Meany, the Bahamas, to Juno Beach, Florida. In 2013, on her fifth attempt, and at age 64, she became the first person claiming to have swum from Cuba to Florida. That's it. Without the aid of a shark cage, swimming from Havana to Key West, although this has not been formally ratified by any recognized swim body. Nyad also once ranked 13th among U.S. women squash players. So that's going to be Jodie Foster's new film, although it's Annette Benning uh, in the title role and not uh, Jodie Foster. But yeah, after 50 years, she's still um, she's still very much acting. I mean, she's and uh, you know she's won two Oscars since then, and uh, you know um, you know she uh, recently came out as gay about a decade ago. But look, I mean, you know, I think we all still love her as an actress. At least I do. I mean. She's been in uh, more than enough films that I've watched and enjoyed, even if the films weren't great. Um, I mean, uh, 
just to just to bring up her filmography real quick because well like i said i'm going to be doing a contact sometime next week i gotta finish the book i gotta finish the book but uh, i will be doing contact uh, next week uh but Yeah, we're not really missing any anything in this scene right here in Napoleon and Samantha. I mean, the grandfather is about to die and, uh, you know, talking to Johnny Whitaker right here. But um, so after this little incident on Napoleon and Samantha, she later starred in uh, Kansas City Bomber the same year, which I will be doing next month. That's a movie starring Raquel Welch. I'm looking forward to that. And of course, she did Freaky Friday, Foxes, Taxi Driver. And uh, in the 80s, uh, she did some films like The Accused, which she won the very first Academy, uh, her first Oscar for. Let's see, she did uh, Summersby with, uh, with Richard Gere, Maverick with Mel Gibson, uh, Nell with Liam Neeson, and in The King, uh, Flight Plan, Inside Man, The Brave One. I mean, that's the thing. A lot of these films are actually really good. Um, even if not all of them are great, but I mean, she has a very consistent record of choosing good prod, uh, projects. Um, she also directed the beaver. I mean, she's also directed several films like little man Tate and, uh, the beaver of course. And, um, so, and, and, uh, yeah, she's going to be in Nyads uh, um, later this year. So, I mean, Jodie Foster is still going strong on screen after 50 years. So, I mean, uh, and after I watched Napoleon and Samantha, I, I had to tell myself, okay, was her presence in this movie enough uh, to justify recommending it? Because uh, we're going to get to some very, um, uh, some very sketchy scenes in this movie coming up. I mean, it's amazing this movie is G-rated uh, because I was, uh, needless to say, I was a bit shocked by a few things in this movie, uh, which certainly uh, don't lend it... Uh, this does not feel like a Disney movie. It's at one point. Let's put it that way. It really does um, circle around into something really bizarre. Uh, I mean, Michael Douglas is, of course, uh, top build, but he doesn't come until about 35, 40 minutes into the movie. And so, I mean, it mostly focuses in, the, in these early scenes. It most, mostly focuses on the kids up until the grandfather passes away. And the way he meets Michael Douglas is very, very interesting. It's, uh, here again, not something I ever would have guessed uh, from a movie like this. Now, as most people know, because I did a, a commentary for Romancing the Stone uh, at the beginning, beginning of this year, you know, Michael Douglas is one of my absolute favorites. I mean, whether he's acting, whether he's producing, um, you, you know, the man, I mean, he can almost do no wrong. I mean, even when he makes silly movies like Disclosure, which are basically basically just variations of, of characters that he's played in the past, I mean, I still love the guy, and I still love uh, a lot of the projects that he attaches himself to. I mean, he also produced movies like Face Off, you know, which we are also celebrating the 25th anniversary of, you know, um, you know Starman for John Carpenter, you know, stuff like that. And I, I've come to realize, man, he's made a lot of wise choices over the years as a actor and as a producer. This is, um, here again, this was made when he was very, very young. I believe he was 23 at the time. <clears throat> I mean, he'll be coming here in a few minutes. I mean, he's not on screen yet. He's not on screen yet. I mean, we're only about 25 minutes in uh, to Napoleon and Samantha. But uh, here we have Jodie Foster and um, hmm. Jodie Foster and uh, Johnny Whitaker again. Is uh, yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. I saw this movie for the first time this year, and it's a relatively short film. I mean, like I said, it's only 92 minutes. <clears throat> but it felt longer than it needed to be. It felt like one of those, you know, Disney movies that was stretched out. And it doesn't have a lot of comedy. I mean, it does focus on very serious themes, including uh, death, uh, which we have this very long shot 
of uh, Johnny Whitaker right here, a close-up showcasing his reaction as he realizes that his grandfather has just passed away. And now he has a pet lion to look after. <laughs> But yeah, the director really uh, does uh, pause on that for a while. Now, uh, Bernard Mc McEvt did not make a lot of movies. I mean, he um, he did do uh, Tom Sawyer right after this with both uh, Johnny Whitaker and Jodie Foster in that uh, Arthur P. Jacobs production that I talked about, which was a musical version of the story. Um, but at the same time, I mean... Yeah, okay. He is the nephew of producer Stephen McBET, who often collaborates with Mel Gibson. So Bernard has worked primarily in television, uh, and he's only directed a few uh, feature films like The Brotherhood of Satan. Yeah, he actually directed a 1971 movie right before Napoleon and Samantha called uh, uh, The Brotherhood of Satan, which is a supernatural horror movie uh, produced and written by L.Q. Jones. And it follows a man while traveling through the American Southwest with his young daughter and girlfriend encounter a small town where a coven of Satanists are kidnapping a local children to transfer their souls into their bodies. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think Disney made the right choice in, in picking him as the director of this. I mean, <laughs> look, I'm sure the guy is a lovely guy, okay? <laughs> Just, but come on, they hired the guy that directed a movie called The Brotherhood of Satan. <laughs> I mean, they didn't put that on the posters for Napoleon and Samantha for obvious reasons. <laughs> I, I mean, like, that's just a number of just really, really odd things about this production. I mean, it really is. Um, and he also did second unit work on the, on another cult horror movie called The Return of Dracula, which came out in 1958. Um, and it follows Dracula, who murders an artist aboard a train in Central Europe and proceeds to impersonate the man, traveling to meet with his extended family in a small California town. <laughs> so, yeah. And he also produced the, t uh, the TV series uh, Samaran Strip, which he often directed, and he also uh, did uh, 31 episodes of the TV series Combat. And uh, his Western directing credits include uh, Rawhide, Gunsmoke, Bonanza, The Virginian, The Big Valley, Young Maverick, and the miniseries How the West Won. And his other credits include In the Heat of the Night, Airwolf, Blue Thunder, Night Rider, Vegas, The Fall Guy, Simon and Simon, Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, Eight is Enough, Petroselli, Three for the Road, The Incredible Hulk, The Dukes of Hazard, and Charlie's Angels, among others. Uh, Bernard McEVT died in Encino, Los Angeles, California, age 79, of undisclosed natural causes, survived by his wife, children, and grandchildren. So this is one of the few films that he had directed, uh, along with The Brotherhood of Satan and uh, Tom Sawyer. <laughs> That's quite a filmography. I mean, you got, you got to admit, <laughs> it's great. So, um, okay. Uh, just to do a timestamp here real quick, we are approximately uh, 30 minutes in. And uh, here we have Michael Douglas uh, on screen, the great Michael Douglas. And uh, like I said, this was not his first movie. Uh, this was not his, uh, his uh, first cinematic rodeo, as you could say. <laughs> um, even though Jodie Foster made her film debut in this movie, uh, Michael Douglas actually did four movies before Napoleon and Samantha. Um, let's see, yeah, just to double check, he was born in uh, 1944, September 25th, 1944. So in this movie, he is about 28. He's about 28, but he plays a, a hippie college student. So uh, he's uh, so he's actually playing a character who's like 23. Um, yeah, like 23, 24, something like that. But um, 
Yeah, he did four movies before Napoleon and Samantha. In 1966, he made his uncredited uh, uh, debut as a Jeep driver in Cast a Giant Shadow, which starred Kirk Douglas, his uh, father, and Yul Brenner and John Wayne and Frank Sinatra and Angie Dickinson. So, yeah, I mean, the first movie he made was with his own father, uh, Kirk Douglas. Uh, he was also in the 1969 film Hail Hero, uh, directed by David Miller, which he actually starred in. Uh, during the Vietnam War, he plays a college student, Carl Dixon, who quits school and joins the Army in hopes of using love, not bullets, to combat the Viet Cong. Uh, I've never seen that movie, but it does sound interesting. And like I said, that was uh, he was the star of that in uh, 1969. So this was not even his uh, first starring movie. Um, <laughs> and then uh, between Hail Hero and Napoleon and Samantha, he did um, a 1970 movie called Adam at 6 a.m., which he also starred in, directed by Robert Shearer, where he plays a semantics professor at a California college who becomes complacent in his life and hears about the death of a relative in Missouri. He drives across country to attend the funeral and pay his respects and decides to spend the summer there working as a laborer. He meets Jerry Joe Hopper and falls in love along the way, developing new friendships with the town locals. He then must decide what direction he wants his life to go, whether to stay in Missouri or return to California. And uh, that... Um, that movie probably didn't do very well because it only had a budget of $1 million and it doesn't even have box office listed. And then finally, he also did a 1971 movie with Jack Warden and Brenda Vaccaro and Barbara Bel Geddes, who I mentioned before, uh, called Summer Tree, 1971, directed by Anthony Newley, about a young man who drops out of university, falls in love with an older married woman, played by Brenda Vaccaro, and contemplates dodging the draft to avoid serving in the Vietnam War. The screenplay was written by Edward Hume and Stephen Yaffa, based on the 1967 play of the same name by Ron Cohen. And like I said, I've never seen any of those films, but um, after reading about them, you know, they, they all sound interesting. And Michael Douglas, I mean, like I said, uh, already starred in three films before Napoleon and Samantha. And uh, here he basically plays a college student who needs to pay for his textbooks. So he gets hired by 11-year-old Napoleon to be a, a grave digger uh, for uh, his grandfather. Uh, yes, Walt Disney Productions uh, rated G for general audiences. Uh, but, but we haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> I mean, this is not, I mean, this is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this very, very, very bizarre Disney production. Um, it's really weird because when I finished watching it for the first time today, I, I told myself, you know what? This really is not a bad movie. And I don't think it's anything that the uh, studio should be absolutely ashamed of. Uh, sort of like a, you know, a situation kind of like uh, like Song of the South, uh, that kind of thing. But it's just a very odd duck. And it has an unusually uh, unusually high amount of adult themes, uh, which you wouldn't see normally in a, in a G-rated Disney movie from 1972. I mean, I'm just going to come out and say it, uh, because even though we don't find out until the very end, but look, I mean... It's the, it's the one thing about this movie that I think makes it very, very questionable as, quote-unquote, family entertainment, uh, even, though it's not, um, even though it's not blunt about it. Uh, it the subtext is there. There's enough subtext there. Uh, basically, Michael Douglas leaves... Okay, okay. Actually, before I even get to the ending, because I know we're still far from the ending, let me say... The middle section of Napoleon and Samantha is actually fairly riveting. Um, uh, the middle section that we're coming up on here, which uh, features, um, you know, Napoleon, he's scared about going into an orphanage and everything. And so he uh, basically goes off with, uh, <laughs> with Major in the wilderness with Jodie Foster. <laughs> I, I know this is a, a just a weird, weird movie, but... Um, but after he hires Michael Douglas to bury his grandfather, 
uh, he decides to just run off. He runs off with the lion and a pet rooster and uh, Samantha uh, to try to find um, <laughs> to try to find a goat a goat herder uh, named Danny who lives in the mountains. And so Napoleon can avoid being sent to an orphanage. Uh, that's essentially the whole idea in a nutshell. And uh, of course, Michael Douglas turns out to be uh, uh, that uncle. Uh, but um, <laughs> and it's in this middle section where it becomes very much like uh, a lot of those Disney nature films that came out in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, which were also a few of them were notorious in terms of uh, uh, accusations of uh, animal cruelty. Um, there's one particularly famous one uh, with lemmings uh, running off a cliff. Uh, White Wilderness. Yeah, it was a 1958 film. Yeah, noted for its propagation of the misconception of lemming mass suicide, uh, but it started. It, it started. It's uh, you know some people started questioning Disney's uh, practices when it came to animal handling on the sets of their films, and in fact, one of my favorite films from that period, which of course is The Incredible Journey, based on the book, and of course it was remade in 1993 as Homeward Bound: The Incredible Journey. Even though I, I can still watch that movie, there are a couple moments, and yes, a couple of moments, uh, one involving a bear, another one involving a lynx, that are uh, very questionable and very uh, eyebrow-raising and kind of alarming. Um, now, I'm pretty much almost willing to give these crew members the benefits, the uh, benefit of the doubt in that these animals were just exceptionally well trained. Uh, well, you know, in some of these early productions, you can really, uh, you know, you really do question if that was the case. Uh, I don't think it necessarily ruins the film per se. I think there, there's definitely a case by case basis here because, and, and in certain uh, uh, things like White Wilderness, we're not 100% certain what exactly went on. Uh, even in something like The Adventures of Milo and Otis, which has become like the poster child for uh, animal cruelty on screen. Yes, along with Cannibal Holocaust. Uh, but, <laughs> but I mean, look, I believe in my heart of hearts that a lot of these trainers uh, knew how to handle these animals and that the animals usually, you know, were able to get through these scenes with no issues on really just harming each other. And I highly doubt they, you know, they ever, you know, that there was never any intentional, you know, um, there was nothing intentional on the part of these handlers to actually uh, have animals killed on screen. Um, and here in Napoleon and Samantha, there is an entire sequence. We are, it's coming up here um, because, I mean, uh, Napoleon hasn't even left yet at this point, but uh uh, but there is a sequence coming up which is very violent for a G-rated Walt Disney film from 1972. Uh, and it's between um, one of the other lions that was used for the production. It wasn't major, uh, but it was one of the other lions, maybe possibly the lion that attacked uh, Jodie Foster. Uh, but there is actually a bear versus lion <laughs> a sequence in this movie. And it is quite a sight to behold. Um here again, especially for a 1972 Disney film. I mean, it's very much a sight to behold. Um, but at the same time, when I finished watching Napoleon and Samantha for the first time today, I tried to really come to terms as to whether, look, okay, this is the 50th anniversary. Is this movie worth seeing? Is it worth recommending to family audiences? Does it work for, for small children? I don't know. And here again, I can understand parents being a little alarmed by such unsavory elements as, um, well, you know, here again, a lion, uh, you know, during production that actually attacked uh, little Jodie Foster here. Uh, but look, 
uh, it's going to have to be mentioned eventually. But uh, the villain of this movie, uh, very, very late in the game, uh, introduced very late in the game, is wanted by the police. And although he's referred to as a psycho, um, at the very end of the film, it's implied that he is actually, and I'm not kidding, it's actually implied that he's a pedophile. There's not no overt references. There are, you know, it's very, it's suggestive, but, but at the same time, if a kid were to watch this movie, I don't think they would make the connection. So, but that's still a pretty alarming thing. And I even read some reviews that even uh, questioned that element, despite the fact that this movie, despite its relative obscurity, and this is the biggest shocker of them all. A lot of the reviews out, out there that exist are actually positive. That's not a joke. This is one of the most obscure Disney movies, and it's certainly very obscure in terms of the international movie database uh, because I am not kidding. There are less than two, uh, less than 10 user IMDb reviews for Napoleon and Samantha, and there's only a few uh, professional write ups. But for the most part, the reaction is actually fairly positive for the movie, which is the most astonishing thing of all. Uh, there's only seven reviews at IMDb, and I wanted to uh, briefly uh, touch, upon, uh, touch upon them right here. Nice little G movie, young Jodie Foster and young Michael Douglas star. The acting and filming are okay. It's just a good little G-rated movie with no sex, no cursing, or violence. <laughs> no, not exactly. Uh, what I found most interesting are seeing Michael Douglas in his 20s and Jodie Foster about eight or nine when the filming was done and mentally comparing that to their megastar status today. Well, that's the obvious attraction to Napoleon and Samantha today, uh, particularly for adult audiences. If you like Michael Douglas and if you like Jodie Foster and you think, oh, they did a film together uh, with Disney back in 72. Yeah, I checked that out. That's one of the reasons why I did a 50th anniversary commentary for this, because I think it does because I think it deserved at least that much attention. <laughs> um, uh, one person gave it a 10 out of 10, called it a warm, endearing children's film classic. Uh, this has always been one of my favorite family Disney films when I was growing up. Now that I'm much older, I like it even more. It's a better film than you would expect it to be and a much better film than it is given credit. Michael Douglas is just great, as are Johnny Whitaker and Jodie Foster in the title roles. Not only are Whitaker and Foster appealing, but their acting is really very good. As for... Uh, okay, and we're going to go back to this in a second, but... Um, as for the reviewer who claimed the lion looked drugged up during this film, that's dumb and ridiculous. Major the lion was very old when this was filmed. Major hardly seems drugged since they have him chasing mountain lions and fighting bears and running and jumping. Major wasn't drugged, he was just old. This is an outstanding film and more of a Disney classic than people want to give it credit for. Okay, let's, let's stop there for a moment. <laughs> Okay, time out. <laughs> time out just right there. And as we see on screen, a uh, mountain lion is ch is uh, chasing the pet rooster. <laughs> Jody Foster is pointing it out. And Major finally decides to go after uh, the uh, the rooster, although we don't know if he's going after the, you know, the mountain lion or the rooster or both of them. <laughs> I mean... Uh, it's kind of hard to tell with how this was filmed. And it, it does, I, I hate to say it, but it does literally look like somebody threw that rooster on screen. Look, I know. I mean, these do bring up some very serious questions in these type of productions. I mean, and this lion, I can almost guarantee you, is not major. Uh, because I, I think major, okay, look, let, let's, okay. Major was very old during the filming of this. I would t I grant you that. Uh, that's part of the reason why he looks like he's about to fall asleep much of the time. I mean, he really looks like he can barely keep his eyes open throughout this production. Uh, do I think that the animals were drugged in any way? I mean, 
It's, I mean, here again, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. And uh, even though this movie is available on DVD, there are no bonus features with people who made the film during that time. Now, I'm sure that, if, you know, maybe I'm sure Michael Douglas or Jodie Foster would have said something at this point if there was any, like, true, like, poor animal handling on, on this film. And we haven't talked about the animal handler yet, who is also... Uh, uh, the screenwriter, and he's one of the names I mentioned during the credits to remember. So, but we're gonna get to him eventually. Trust me, we're gonna get to him eventually because uh, he's directed some of the uh, worst films in history. Uh, later, far after Napoleon and uh, Samantha. But among the other very few reviews, like, oh man, <laughs> that's... did that lion just like? somersault into the creek there because they were pulling him with a rope. Okay, I'm not going to I'm not going to scan this at too much because you know, here again, I mean we I can't make assumptions. I don't think any of us can make assumptions. But I mean but anyway, okay. Moving moving Disney offering. Disney family offering that was Jodie Foster's first feature appearance. A uh, little unusual for the film's dealings with death. Uh, the only human death I can recall in the Disney live action film and the above mentioned child molester. Like I said, we're getting to that. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, Disney adventure six out of 10. Napoleon gets into mischief with his friend, Samantha. You could say that again. They steal empty bottles and resell them to the store owner for candy, blah, 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 blah. Uh, see, I checked this out for Jody Foster and Michael Douglas. Damn. Jody was just a kid and it's sad to read that she was, mauled by one of the lions the kids are cute and charming there are a lot of dark elements in this kids movie the locals are a little too much of bumpkins the most compelling aspect is the two kids on the journey with the lion that's a small part of the movie it's an odd little disney adventure uh okay and five out of ten a cool and intriguing concept just not fulfilled one bit a waste I appreciate the darker tone that Napoleon and Samantha attempts to provide. Sadly, none of it really sticks and it comes out as slow-paced, dull, would-be adventure. The cast features two very familiar names. Ladder doesn't have much to do while Douglas plays an oddly written character. Johnny Whitaker, fresh off the lovely biscuit eater, is all right. Will Gear's role has a lot of heart, if not much else. They try to cram so many different elements into this to the point it feels overcrowded and unrefined. There's a lion in the film for practically no reason whatsoever, as well as unexplored plot lines and characters. Um, a cool and intriguing concept, just not fulfilled one bit disappointing. And last but not least, uh, quoting a very good friend of mine, John uh, Syruga, uh, over at Twitter, and he writes, Dolesville Disney Adventure. Determined boy runs away from his rural community rather than risk being placed in an orphanage, taking along his pet lion and little girlfriend for a journey through rugged terrain. Family film from Disney with nature adventure asides never really gets going, mostly due to that sleepy lion ambling through the picture as if drugged. Now, here again, <laughs> I mean, okay, maybe he was drugged, maybe he wasn't drugged, I don't know. And like I said, but you could also take the other person's excuse that he was just old and tired. I guess you could. The kids, talented Johnny Whitaker from Family Affair and Wise Talking Jodie Foster in her first film role, are both good, and even though they occasionally struggle with their delivery. Michael Douglas has fine, if colorless, well said, supporting role as a well-meaning hippie type who comes to their rescue. Younger children might enjoy it. Two stars out of four. Yeah, I would say that's... That's pretty much where I stand with this movie. It's not it's not terrible by any means in terms of its plot or its acting or even its story. It's just a, an odd film. I mean, particularly for this studio. And and you know, it's amazing, you know, 50 years later when we're talking about the Disney studio as if it might be on the verge of bankruptcy. I mean, you know, I mean, Lightyear was such a, a, a massive bomb and, uh, you know, them trying to basically force, um, you know, lesbian kissing onto parents and then they have to explain to their kids and everything. 
from what I understand when it comes to light year, it was, uh, I guess you could say, even though I don't really like the term woke, but unnecessarily woke. And now uh, Disney is being accused of like forcing these, uh, these elements in, into the youth of America. And, you know, um, Chris Evans got quite a bit of flack for some of the comments that he made. Um, I'm not going to comment on all that in terms of my own personal opinion because I haven't seen Lightyear. And uh, I'm just uh, absorbing what uh, the reactions have been. But uh, Disney is not in a very good spot right now. I mean, especially when they're dealing with all this uh, Florida tax nonsense with the with – the, uh, with the governor down there. I mean, they've been, uh, they've been in some hot water recently with, you know, light year and with their uh, uh, issues down in Florida and everything. So Disney has been, you know, Disney has been on the skit. I mean, uh, and in fact, people are saying that if, uh, you know, if the upcoming Marvel movies don't do well, you know, they could be in some serious trouble uh, because apparently uh, parents are like turning away their kids to their movies now and they don't, uh, you know, they don't feel safe when it comes to movies uh, where they try to, you know, I guess, promote this agenda. I mean, here again, I haven't seen Lightyear and I'm not going to try to speculate as to what exactly people are upset about when it comes to that. This is just what I've read and what I've seen and heard. Uh, but Disney is not doing well at the moment. Uh, and it makes something like Napoleon and Samantha seem rather mild in comparison. Um, it really does. Now, now here's a little bit in the movie where admittedly I have to, I, uh, well, okay. You know, this was filmed at a time where you could only film in certain areas, I guess. And this was, you know, filmed obviously in, uh, this, um, state park in Oregon, which has mountains and everything. Um, but I, I'm wondering, and I'm not even looking at the film right now, just to let you know, because I think uh, if somebody could have told the director that they could have gotten a better angle shooting Jodie Foster when he, when she climbs over the lion, I'm not even going to just describe it. But, uh, you know, it's just it, it's a little alarming. And I, here again, I don't think it was anything intentional or I mean, because like I said, they only had a limited number of ways to shoot this sequence and um you know, other sequences in this movie, but it's like, eh, somebody should have let the director know, Hey, maybe you should, uh, uh, maybe you should adjust the ca a camera or mount it in, in another place. Um, not going any further with that. Just, just, uh, just saying. And, uh, here we have some, um, some fairly credible, I guess you could say, uh, background, uh, effect, where, I mean, apparently, uh, yeah, Napoleon is now hanging for his life on this mountain. I mean, it, I mean, I don't know. I mean, is this really a family movie? I guess. I mean, well, you could also question the same thing about uh, one movie I do think is very much a family movie, even though I can see here again another example of parents being very uh, alarmed. Um, in 1969, uh, just three years before Napoleon and Samantha, there was a movie called My Side of the Mountain. Um, and it was basically about a kid that decides to go the Henry D David Thoreau route. And so he literally runs away from home, literally runs away from home. Um, we never even meet his parents or his family at any time in the movie. And he runs away from home. He lives out in the wilderness very much, uh, you know, uh, using his Boy Scout skills and his survival skills. And he lives like Henry David Thoreau off the land and he raises a, uh, an eagle, uh, or no, a falcon, excuse me. He, um, he tames and uh, raises a falcon. Uh, and it actually came out of, you know, the same year as a British film about a boy and a falcon called Kez. Uh, but my side of the mountain, I remember when I watched it and thinking, you know what, this is actually a really good family film, but I do wonder if parents would would freak out if they would start thinking that, you know, their kids are going to start running away from home or something. I just can't help but think that. But I mean, the book it's based on is actually an award winning uh, children's book. So, uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a parent myself and I know that, um, 
you know, obviously you have to be very selective when it comes to your kids' entertainment. But do I recommend Napoleon and Samantha for a young audience? You know, I really am hesitating here. And, and like I said, it's not even that it's a bad movie because it's not a bad movie. But here again, it raises these questions. And I just, I... Maybe I'm just afraid about parents getting on me and it's like, well, you recommended this movie to my kid and it has all these elements in it. Look, I mean, look, 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 it's a it's a 1972 Disney movie. I there's nothing definitive about it that suggests there was actual animal cruelty. And like I said, the whole thing with the um, the whole thing with the villain in the movie is kind of kind of out of left field. And I'm surprised they actually went there. I'm surprised they actually decided to go in that direction when it came to um, bringing in an antagonist. But um, and like I said, it's it's not only that, but this film goes in so many other weird directions where halfway through the movie, I mean, when uh, when uh, Michael Douglas at one point, he actually jumps on a motorcycle. And I, I'm serious when I say that a large portion of this film is basically just a chase up until the uh, up into the in the mountains, uh, where uh, Michael Douglas is being chased by the law enforcement, and he has to save the kids in his cabin uh, when he leaves um, this psycho with them. I mean, yeah, I mean, I really, really do hesitate recommending this to to younger audiences. It's not so much I'm worried about parental retaliation, but just so much that, I mean, I don't think it's a bad movie. I think there are actually some genuine moments that are classic Disney in the sense that they are warm and they do teach valuable lessons. But at the same time, I just like there's only there's one too many things. There's just one too many things that is just really keeping me from even recommending it to young children. It just, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I mean, this is one of those, uh, this is just one of those instances where it's really hard to recommend it, even though there are good things about it. As a whole, I don't think it, I don't think it works. And and I do I do I do think that these elements are just a bit too much for a for young children. Maybe a family audience that that could. Um, but then again, I mean, why would they want to have these even these discussions? You know, because when the ending comes around, it's a little weird, and we'll get to it when we when we get to it. But it just I don't know. It just. It leaves the you leave the movie with this very very weird, very weird sense that. Well, I should go ahead and and start talking about the um, the screenwriter of this movie because I mean if anybody has a lot to answer for it's actually the screenwriter. Uh, the screenwriter of this movie is. Uh, somebody by the name of Stuart Raphael. And he is a British writer and director. And uh, he made his feature uh, debut as the director uh, in a movie starring Dan Haggerty, uh, of all people, called The Tender Warrior. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he also directed other films like When the North Wind Blows and... Uh, uh, or AKA Snow Tigers. This was his second film, by the way. This was chosen by the National Association of Theater Owners as Movie of the Month. Napoleon and Samantha was chosen as National Association, Association of Theater Owners Movie of the Month. Well, uh, that's um, that's a little shocking right there. Now. And see here, here, here's the thing. I mean, <laughs> those darn IMDb viewers—they just love their warm and endearing G-rated adventures. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <it's laughs> uh, it's as if. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but okay, so we have to talk about the screenwriter of this real quick. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, see, okay, we got approximately 32 minutes left to go. And I swear that the lion actually, you know, does a little thing with his back legs after he defeats the bear. It's so bizarre. It's so bizarre. Okay, but Stuart Raffel later directed the Sea Gypsies, uh, which won the Film Advisory Board of Excellence. And he also directed the Philadelphia Exper uh, Experiment, which won the Best Science Fiction Rome International Film Festival Award as the best film at Fanta, Fanta Festival. However, uh, in 1984, he also uh, wrote and directed uh, 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 an MGM film called The Ice Pirates, starring Robert Ulrich and Mary Crosby. And it's, here again, a movie that you cannot describe as anything other than bizarre. It's just, it's set in the distant future where water is so scarce and ration that is considered an immensely valuable substance. Well, actually, that doesn't that doesn't sound so bizarre or ridiculous now, does it? Uh, both as a commodity and as a currency in ice cubes. The Templars of Mithra control the water and they destroy worlds that have natural water, leaving the galaxy virtually dry. Pirates dedicate their lives to raiding ships and looting the ice from the cargo holds to make a living. And uh, it's, yeah, and Robert Urich is the leader of a band of pirates that raid a Templar cruiser for its ice and discover a beautiful princess in a stasis pod. Of course. Uh, he decides to kidnap her, waking her up and alarming Templars. Jason as pirates flee. flee. Uh, it's, yeah, it's just a silly, silly movie. I haven't seen it since I was a kid, and I just remember it being silly. You know, there was not much. I mean, it didn't, it uh, barely made its money back at the box office. Um, but then he would make an even more notorious film, Stuart Raffle, when he uh, wrote and directed uh, Mac and Me, which is probably the most famous of E.T. ripoffs out there, which um, uh, basically is about an alien called, which they call Mysterious Alien Creature or Mac. And he escapes from uh, from a, uh, from nefarious NASA agents and befriends a wheelchair using boy named Eric Cruz, and um, of course all the critics said it was just a ripoff of E.T. the Extraterrestrial, uh, and um, Stuart Raffle actually won, won worst director uh, for uh, Mac and Me. So yeah, but despite that, it's become a cult film and. Uh, uh, it has an entire sequence set in a McDonald's. There's actually a musical number in a McDonald's. Uh, and uh, yeah, Stuart Raffle is known for directing that and winning the Razzie Award for it. But then he would just follow it up with something even worse, uh, if you could imagine that. And he followed up uh, Mac and Me with Mannequin 2 on the Move, uh, which is everybody's favorite sequel to the 1987 film called Mannequin, uh, starring... Um, <laughs> Starring uh, Kim Cattrall, Samantha Jones as a mannequin that comes to life in front of uh, Andrew McCarthy. But it's also considered one of the worst films of the 1980s. Well, uh, Stuart Raffle directed the sequel to that called Mannequin 2 on the Move with Christy Swanson and William Ragsdale. Um, he would also, uh, but he would also serve as a screenwriter for uh, Passenger 57. Uh, then he did Tammy and the T-Rex. Let's talk about Tammy and the T-Rex, okay? We need to spend a few minutes talking about Tammy and the T-Rex. So just imagine Paul Walker uh, is boyfriend to Denise Richards, okay? Uh, Paul Walker gets um, roughed up by her ex-boyfriend who is part of a gang, uh, and they kill him, and his soul is going to be saved, in, and his brain and soul are saved and put into this dinosaur, uh, which uh, Terry Kaiser from Weekend at Bernie's has. At least I think it was Terry Kaiser. Yep, Terry Kaiser. Yep. So Paul Walker, now as a dinosaur, 
has to go back to Denise Richards and let her know that she's in danger and all that good stuff. Um, the movie literally ends with uh, Paul Walker's brain having an orgasm because uh, Denise Richards does a strip tease for him. So, uh, and that uh, just recently got a Blu-ray release by Vinegar Syndrome, uh, where they actually released the original R-rated cut of Tammy and the T-Rex. Um, but let's not stop there, shall we? <laughs> let's not let's because Stuart Raffle is on a roll here. I mean, as you can as you can see, <laughs> he's just he's on a total roll here. Uh, after that, he did uh, he wrote and directed the new Swiss Family Robinson, uh, which was a 1998 American adventure film. I never even saw it. Uh, but apparently it was made for television and starred David Carradine and Jane Seymour and James Keach uh, as the new Swiss family Robinson. Oh, oh, wonderful, wonderful. After that, he did do a relatively um, respected film called Grizzly Falls, uh, which was written by Stuart Margolin and Richard Beadle. And that won a number of awards, including the Heartland Film Festival Award, the Marco Island Film Festival Audience Award, and the Golden Reel Award. Uh, and then he also did a very serious film called A Month of Sundays, uh, which stars Rod Steiger in one of his last films. A low-budget, cliche-ridden film featuring a roster of faded stars topped by Rod Steiger as a sweet, stubborn, but alien grandfather searching for his long-lost son before he dies. Wow. Okay. And uh, he, he also did a 2006 film called Survival Island with Billy Zane and Kelly Brook. Um, let's see. What? They wash up on a deserted island, completely alone. Well, it's a $9 million production by Universal Features, and it didn't even make uh, a quarter of that back. Very, very sadly. That was a, uh, a massive bomb for uh, Universal. He also directed a uh, 2007 uh, horror film called Croc uh, for the Sci-Fi Channel. And uh, his last film, well, his last completed film was a 2010 film called Standing Ovation, Dance, Sing, Dream, which is a musical. <laughs> Standing Ovation tells the story of the five ovations, five middle school friends who form a singing group to compete in a national music video contest. And much like Dorothy in her music-laden video uh, trip down the yellow brick road, the five ovations encounter their own share of ups and downs. Uh, throwing up at many of the road roadblocks are arch rivals, the Wiggies. The group is composed of five talented sisters who will do anything to sabotage the ovations' chances of competing for the grand prize of one million dollars. Armed with nothing but talent, passion, and street smarts. The five ovations find something more valuable at the end of their quest that perseverance, family, and friendship, plus a healthy dose of laughter, are instrumental in fulfilling your dreams. Yeah. Uh, from the screenwriter of Napoleon and Samantha and from the director of Mac and Me, uh, Mannequin 2 on the Move, and The Ice Pirates. So that is the, the career of Stuart Raffle in a nutshell. So, <laughs> so he was uh, he was not only animal trainer on Napoleon and Samantha, but he also uh, served as the screenwriter. Now, um, okay, the other name that I was going to mention, along with Stuart Raffles' name in the opening credits, uh, if you remember, is a, a man by the name of Tom Leach. Now, Tom Leach was uh, a producer over at the Disney studio. And uh, he and um, he and Stuart Raffle apparently served as executive producers on uh, uh, Napoleon and Samantha. But uh, his career included uh, working for films under Walt Disney's son-in-law, Ron Miller, 
at, at Disney, Leach first began as an assistant director on, on Mary Poppins, uh, The Ugly Dachshund, and Monkeys Go Home. He then served uh, several positions as producer, associate producer, and director on films such as Snowball Express, Napoleon and Samantha, Freaky Friday, The North Avenue Irregulars. Huh. I don't know exactly what he directed because, yeah, he didn't direct any of those movies. And uh, the project which he pitched to Ron Miller that this could be our exorcist, uh, which is known as The Watcher in the Woods, starring um, Betty Davis and Carol Baker and Lynn Holly Johnson. And uh, this is one of my favorite horror films of all time, believe it or not. And so Tom Leach was the one responsible for bringing the book uh, to Ron Miller to uh, make uh, The Watcher in the Woods as a response to The Exorcist. And uh, I've said before, and I'll, and I'll say it many times, that it came out the same year as The Shining, and I think it makes The Shining look like Sesame Street. So that's how scary I think Watcher in the Woods is, and uh, I just think it's a far more memorable film. And uh, But the last movie that Tom Leach uh, did, because he later served as a producer and unit production manager on uh, the beloved show, The Northern uh, Northern Exposure. Uh, but the last film that he produced for Disney was a bit, another obscure film called uh, Night Crossing, which uh, set in the fall of 1979, one of history's most ingenious and courageous flights to freedom took place when two families fled from communist East Germany in their own handcrafted hot air balloon, starring John Hurt, Jane Alexander, Bo Bridges, Walt Disney Pictures brings to the screen this remarkable true story of the Strelzik and Wetzel families and their daring death-defying escape. Well, I do own the movie. I do like the movie, but I'm being perfectly honest with all of you that it's sadly very much bombed when it came out in 1982. It bombed so much despite a very compelling true story and uh, music by Jerry Goldsmith. And this was, of course, the same year that uh, Jerry Goldsmith did the scores for like Poltergeist and First Blood and uh, that kind of thing. So, but uh, I will always remember Tom Leach for, uh, for of course, producing uh, The Watcher in the Woods. And uh, <laughs> yes, this is the pedophile I was talking about. Uh, <laughs> and of course, the lion has a very sh uh, uh, sharp watch on him, uh, which is good. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, but here we are. We're about to enter the final 20 minutes of Napoleon and Samantha, where uh, Michael Douglas is about to be arrested uh, by the police here. But, of course, he's, try he's trying to explain to... Um, he's trying to explain to Ellen Corby right here that uh, the kids are safe and they're up at his cabin along with the lion and um, the quote-unquote psycho. <laughs> and when I first saw this ending, I just could not believe what was going on because Michael Douglas, straight out of first blood, is going to jump on a motorcycle and cruise up into the mountains with law enforcement in pursuit. And it's a pretty long chase. I mean, that's the thing. This, this Disney movie ends with Michael Douglas jumping on a motorcycle to save these kids in his cabin uh, when after he realizes that the man that he left him with is a psycho uh, or rather a pedophile. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just the most unlike Disney story you could ever imagine in the history of the studio. And here again, what gives this movie some attention is the fact that it has Michael Douglas and Jodie Foster. And here again, I can't deny that there are moments in this movie that do capture that old-fashioned sense of Disney warmth and um, uh, I guess you could say, uh, you know, feeling safe whatever movie that your parents left you to watch. This is not one of those movies, not quite anyway. Uh, here again, do I think the movie is bad? No, I, I just think that it's problematic. 
um, very problematic. And I hesitate to hesitate to, rec to uh, rec recommend this movie to young children because it just there's too many elements to it that make it problematic. I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm not, I'm not doing it because I'm afraid of parents getting on me. I, I can't do it because I just think that it's a little too much for a kid's movie or a, a movie that is made uh, directly for a young audience like this one obviously is. Uh, I don't know if this is just a disconnect with Stuart Raffle in, in terms of... Uh, I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. He's directed some of the most notorious worst films that you could imagine and this film despite some of its weird elements um is not bad it's not bad overall it's just very weird and it doesn't click it doesn't it doesn't come together at the end is very very memorable uh even if you were going to take all of these elements at face value um, I don't know if Disney is necessarily ashamed of this movie, but it's certainly not available on uh, Disney+. Plus. <clears throat> but here again, is it because of those reasons I mentioned before? I don't know. I, I, I have no idea. It's available for rental. I mean, it's not like they're trying to bury it. So I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. But this is without a doubt even more so than some of their later films like The Black Hole and, uh, and Condor Man and, and Tex and, uh, you know, some other obscurities which, um, you know, film historians are very much aware of, but that the general public are very unaware of. This is actually one of Stuart Raffle's better films. And on top of all that, now, see, I, I like what the director does here, even though it's... Um, it, here again, it's just so weird. I, I mean, you could actually see the wanted poster of the pedophile right between the faces of the cop and Michael Douglas as they are talking here. Uh, you know, obviously drawing attention to the fact that, hey, you know, these kids are in danger. And it's only now that Michael Douglas is really, truly realizing what he has done. Yeah, see, Mark Pearson, this man is dangerous. Call your local police department. And I did pause it to look at some of the specific words on there. And some of them are very hard to make out. But here again, it's not until the end. It's not until the very end with something that Michael Douglas says that gives it away um, or at least puts in the subtext that this is a pedophile and not merely a psycho. So here again. And so here, yeah, here's Michael Douglas literally racing out of the police station Literally, it becomes an it becomes an action film all of a sudden. He's running like hell. Like he's running like hell out, out of the police station. All the cops are, are chasing him and going after him. It's, it's, I mean, like I said, it's it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. It's, I mean, I mean, he just jumped over a fence. You know, he's going through people's yards and everything while the cops are in hot pursuit and everything. <laughs> he literally slips into the into the grass. Oh, that was amazing. Michael Douglas actually slipping into the grass was one of the most amazing moments of this movie, seriously. He almost trips and falls there. Oh, he's running. He's running for his life right here. <laughs> he's like, the cop is like, hey. <laughs> like I said, one of the most bizarre, bizarre uh, Disney films you could ever imagine existing. But by God, it exists. And Michael Douglas, he finally uh, looks ahead and sees uh, a motorcycle, somebody riding a motorcycle in the, dif dis uh, in the distance, nearly gets run over by a car in the process. 
And he literally just pushes the guy to the ground and steals his motorcycle. Like I said, this is first blood. This has become first blood all of, all of a sudden. And, and the amazing thing is that first blood, the book, uh, came out the same year as Napoleon and Samantha. Now, I, I don't think that Stuart Raffle read it uh, before um, he wrote the script. I don't think that he did. But why this this uh, climax, this third act, is so much like First Blood with Michael Douglas uh, going up into the mountains on a motorcycle to rescue these kids from a pedophile I mean, where did this movie come from? Did this movie come from an alternate universe? I don't understand. Who at Disney thought this was a good idea? I mean, seriously, at the time. Well, I mean, obviously you got Tom Leach's approval, so I guess I better question that. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's just bizarre. It is so bizarre. I mean, here again, I mean, you know, and, and I think John is absolutely right. This is a, a two and a half star, five out of 10 movie. It has its moments. It's the cast that gives it some attention. And look, the cast is good. There's no question. There's no question that the kids are very good. Michael Douglas is very good. Most of the cast is fine. The story is just really bizarre and it feels it feels stretched. It feels uh, stretched and contrived and not very original. I mean, I guess the family aspect of it, it has to do with the lion, but the lion doesn't really do a, a whole hell of a whole lot. The stunt lion does way more than the actual lion, does way more than major. And of course, the stunt line is responsible for nearly mauling Jodie Foster to death. So it's like, I don't know. Anybody that's in the chat right now, please give me your thoughts on this, whether you're watching this or not, because I need, I need some kind of, I, I don't know. I need an addendum here. I need something because this is just one of the, the man. I saw this as an eight-year-old, and I did like the danger of it. Kids metal used to be a top little tougher, maybe. I mean, and I think, I, I think John, didn't you mention that you saw this at the drive-in when it came out in 1972? With, uh, was, it, was it the sword and the stone that you said? I think you told me that on Twitter. I mean, that's just amazing. I mean... I just can't imagine seeing this in a theater in 1972 as a kid and absorbing all these quote unquote dangerous elements. Now, I mean, like I said, I mean, in the early seventies, I think that uh, Disney was a little desperate in some ways to break out of that G rated um, formula because a lot of times it would have, uh, you know, slapstick scenes, uh, in their movies like this. And, and the slapstick, I mean, there's not really a lot of slapstick in this chase scene, but I mean, here again, I mean, the supposed comedy is not very memorable. It's not very funny. Uh, the times when this mo movie tries to be funny, I think it fails. And yet there are other moments that I think are, are well done. It's really bizarre. Now, we're getting into the final 15 minutes of this, and I should go ahead and just read some of the reviews that came out at the time, because there's not much written about this movie. And I think it's important that um, some of these are, are at least mentioned. And I want to start with the New York Times. Yeah, this review was written in 1972 on July 20th, 1972 by Howard Thompson. No, no, Napoleon and Samantha aren't Bonaparte and a lady love. They're two winning youngsters, a boy and a girl with a pet lion. And this is a Disney picture. As Disney features go, it's quite nice, though without much snap. 
The two children, redheaded Johnny Whitaker and especially Joni Fo Jody Foster as his saucy chum, are appealing. So is their shaggy maned pet, a big indolent pussycat who perks up and swats around a mountain lion and a bear. No real rough stuff. On cue, against the backdrop of some fetching mountain scenery, Will Gear as a kindly grandpa and dispenses sensibility and wisdom and Michael Douglas plays a sturdy, clean-cut hippie type for a change. Both actors are excellent. There's some commotion at the end with Douglas and the police racing to a mountain cabin to save the children. <laughs> uh, they're spunky enough generally to take care of themselves. All in all, pr prodded by Bernard McEVT's direction, the picture coasts along easily on its own genial hominess. Its prime spectacle is a three-way chase. Tearing away in front and squawking like crazy is a white rooster named Doodle Doo, pursued by a mountain lion who's pursue, pursued by the hero lion called Major. The children should enjoy this one. They did audibly yesterday at the Juliet II Theater. Okay, so yeah, the New York Times was generally positive with their assessment. And uh, then we have uh, Peter Henson, who uh, writes a blog called Every 70s Movie. And he's, he writes, uh, the peculiar movie begins by establishing the lifestyle of rural urchin Napoleon, who lives with his kind-hearted grandfather. Napoleon's best friend is Samantha, who resides nearby with her stern guardian. One day, Napoleon and Grandpa encounter an old circus clown who's traveling through with Major, a tame lion. And they inexplicably, Grandpa accepts the clown's request to become Major's caregiver. After a few cutesy scenes of life on the farm with a lion, Grandpa dies, so Napoleon goes to a job office and hires graduate student Danny as a grave digger. Seriously, this is the plot. Lying to Danny by saying that a relative will soon c collect Napoleon, the boy instead embarks on a trip with Major and Samantha, who tags along for reasons that are never particularly clear. Then once the trio survives near misses with nasty animals and steep cliffs, they track down Danny, who promptly leaves him in the care of a stranger. Naturally, Danny discovers the stranger is an escaped psychopath, as one will, and runs to the kid's rescue. For viewers willing to ignore logic, Napoleon and Samantha has a few admirable elements. Douglas, Foster, and Gear elevate their roles as much as possible, given the material, and Major, an animal performer featured in myriad films and TV shows, has an impressive bag of tricks. Or rather, the alternate animals uh, have tricks. Tr uh, plus, truth be told, the scenes about death have a certain lyricism, even if they feel like they belong in a different movie. See, I actually agree with that. I actually do absolutely agree with that. And uh, if you want to get this movie on DVD, there is a DVD out there. And I found a DVD review it online uh, by, um, let's see, who wrote this? It doesn't have an author here, but this is a DVD review that I found. Um, uh. Napoleon and Samantha changes gears a few times. It starts out as an intimate small town coming of age tale, develops into a grand expedition in the wild, and then finishes with a quick paced, action packed climax. However, this refreshingly only leaves surprises ahead for the viewer. Through it all, the film remains entertaining and most interesting. The hybrid of subjects and tones works incredibly well as the story stays fresh and highly watchable. The young leads are compelling, and Michael Douglas's top-billed college student is a good role and makes for a highlighting performance. There's excitement and sweetness, and all the elements successfully come together to a quality Disney film. Unlike the other, not, unlike the other two 1972 Johnny Whitaker films, Disney saw fit to present Napoleon and Samantha in its original aspect ratio of 1.85 anamorphic widescreen. Video quality is very pleasing, as the most pristine print exhibits vibrant, vibrant colors and appropriate sharpness. The pleasant Northwest scenery is wonderfully rendered with an excellent clarity. 
The transfer app aptly and accurately handles all situations, dark and light, outdoors and indoors. This is one of the best looking DVDs of a 70s Disney film. With the film presented in Dis Dolby Mono, the, the di DVD displays high quality sound as well. The audio is full with special effects and the score coming in strongly, but never too strongly. And clearly, dialogue is crisp and always distinguishable. And the environmental sounds enhance the drama of the outdoor exp expedition. And the volume is always mixed just right. Overall, it's a simple but highly effective soundtrack. Unfortunately, there are no bonus features for Napoleon and Samantha, one of the few titles of its July catalog batch, which is missing a trailer of any kind. In her interview fe featured right on the Freaky Friday DVD, Jodie Foster discusses her experience filming Napoleon and Samantha and a life-threatening encounter with a lion. This would have been a nice excerpt to include, but alas, we're given nothing in the way of supplements. Music menus are scenic, but ordinary 16 by 9 stills with music from the film's opening credits. The disc opens with the old 90-second promo for classic live-action Disney films on DVD and video, highlighting some of the studio's most popular films of the 60s and 70s. And, and uh, the reviewer's closing thoughts are that Napoleon and Samantha is an endearing and well-made Disney film. Though the DVD could benefit for, from some extra features, the video and audio presentation of the film is excellent. Whether you get it now or wait for a price drop, Disney's DVD release of Napoleon and Samantha is well worth checking out. So, yeah, uh, what's very strange, even more strange than any of the elements in this movie, is that um, a lot of the uh, reviews, both contemporary and retrospective, are positive. Shockingly enough. Um, here again, I think the film is worth seeing. I just, I hesitate to recommend it to little kids unless there's adults present. But, uh, you know, here again, I don't think that the kids will get the whole idea of, oh, yeah, the, you know, the pedophile, he has to go to a hospital because he's very, very sick. You know, I mean, it pretty much gives away what, what, <laughs> that it was a child molester and it, and it kind of, leaves a little bit of a bad taste in this film as we see the end Walt Disney Productions. One of the weirdest Disney films I've ever had the, had the quote unquote pleasure of watching. Uh, I will never forget this movie. I have no reason to buy it, but if you want the DVD, it's absolutely available. And I think that's all uh, that we have to say on Napoleon and Samantha tomorrow night. I will be doing a movie called uh, butterflies are free starring Goldie Hawn. Uh, for its 50th anniversary, uh, which will be at 8 p.m. tomorrow night, Wednesday, July 6th at 8 p.m. Butterflies are free, starring Goldie Hawn. At any rate, uh, thank you all for coming out tonight for this uh, 50th anniversary commentary for Napoleon and Samantha. And just real quick, to say goodbye to people in the chat, like Cliff Booth and uh, John Sir uh, Siruga. Thank you so much for coming out. Yeah, Napoleon was actually issued as the code feature, not a headliner, despite the fact there was a comic book adaptation in a movie tie-in paperback. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, and actually, I saw this with Disney's Robin Hood. Oh, interesting. Oh, wow. So that, that must have been about, yeah, 73. Oh, interesting. So, but yeah, anyway, that's Napoleon and Samantha. Thank you so much for watching and coming out tonight, and I, I will see you all tomorrow night at 8 p.m. for Butterflies Are Free, starring Goldie Hawn. Have a great evening, everybody.